you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to, De- to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, while you're turning there, uh, I always covet your prayers. We do pray that the Lord would meet with us today and that uh, He would grant us His presence. And if that happens, all will be well. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 9, we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Nehemiah chapter 9, the first verse. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read the book of the law of God, the book. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua and Bani and Kadmael and Shebaniah and and Bunai and and Sherebiah and Bina and Chianai and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua and Kadmael and Bana and Hashbaniah and Sherebiah and Sherebaniah and and Hoda and Hodaha and Shebaniah and Peth and Peth Ahina said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone, and have made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all the things that are therein, the seas and all that is in the, the, and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of the heaven worshipeth thee. Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gaveth him the name of Abraham, and found us in his heart and found us his heart faithful before thee, and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it, I say, to his seed, and has formed thy words, for thou art righteous. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your kindness to our church. Lord, we thank you for your provision down through the years. God, we pray now that you would honor your word with the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, um, reading some fairly familiar verses of Scripture this morning, uh, with the reconstruction of the temple and the reconstruction of the land of Israel, and really the reconstruction of God's people. In the book of Ezra, we read of Ezra's burden to go back and to rebuild the physical temple where the Lord's people had worshipped, and Nehemiah tends to address the spiritual issues that kept them from worshiping despite the fact of having a temple. Now, anybody can build a building that is set aside for the Lord's service, but it's quite a different thing for a people to be set aside for the Lord's service. Uh, man can set aside a building and say, hey, we'll use this to meet in, but only God has the ability to set aside people. That belongs to him. That's the work that God gives unto himself. And it's a wonderful and marvelous thing to have a place to come in out of the weather and meet, but that is not the emphasis of ministry, nor should it ever have been. And so we find 
Ezra kind of covers the uh, the uh, restorative part of Israel, and now we find that Nehemiah begins to address some spiritual issues. Now, I go from church to church, and I see different things going on, and even in, and I want you to always remember that the, the books of the Jews were addressed to the Jews. They weren't addressed to the world out here, and the Lord's Word has never been addressed to the world it was. It's always been to His people. So the problems that Nehemiah found, he found among God's people. And we'll see uh, as we look at the text this morning and at the, at the way that Abraham was set aside in a special way that many of those problems still exist. Uh, you want to know why our churches have no power? It's because of that. And I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about a mushrooming of numbers. I'm talking about just having the old-fashioned power of God where he meets with his people and he manifests his word to his people. And you can leave and say, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. And that's what they were needing, and that's what they had really lacked for the cap years of the captivity, and they're finally back, and then there's some spiritual issues that have to be addressed. In the first year, uh, in the first verse, the Bible says, now, in the 20 and 4th day of this month. Now, you think about the longest stretched out meeting that you have ever been to, and, and see what you can come up with, and the best that I could come up with was 10 days. 10 days of meeting in a row back to back, and that's the most that I could ever see. Uh, you know, what keeps us from 24 days? And I would have to say it's our patience, don't you? Mm -hmm. And, and on, uh, on top of that, I would say it's what thrills our hearts. You know, when something is interesting and it's encouraging you, you won't have no trouble coming back. But if you're bored with it and rather be on Facebook, then you have an issue, right? And, and so uh, these people were patient on the Lord God. If you want revival and you want to understand a little bit about the character of Abraham, then you have to do things like this. You have to be patient in the service of the Lord and you can't, you can't quit after seeking him one day. You have to continue to do it. Now, on the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting. And, and that's literally fasting. They had gone some days without food. They had set themselves apart to seek the face of the Lord. And, and that's a wonderful thing. It's something God's people should still find themselves doing. And with sackcloths. Now, sackcloths was a particular type of clothing that they wore. It was black. And into our culture just a few years ago, it was a shame to go to a funeral without that being dressed in black. And it was because of grief. It was an outshowing of remorse. It was an outshowing of feeling sorrow for the death. And when I went to my little great nephew's funeral, I was blown away about some of the things they had on. And I thought, well, my grandmother would turn over her grave and she could see what, what some of these, you know what? You know what it is? It's a lack of respect. Sure. Even when mother died, y'all were there. I mean, I, I, was, still, I was blown away. Uh, and uh, another thing it's a lack of is putting on the grief garment. You, you know what's wrong with the Lord's churches? When sin appears, they don't put on the grief garment. Now, what that really is or what it should be, and it got to where it was just a pretense. It's kind of like uh, the garments they wore to go worship in the temple in. It became something of a pretense and they just put them on. But what that should be is a reflection of the inward man, that blackness. You know, you know, man is just a vile creature inside and out. And that sackcloth was a representation of how black and ungodly he really was. It wasn't just something to throw on. And you know what? At least at this time in the ministry of Nehemiah, they were there. They recognized the sin in their life. They, they realized the mistakes that they had made and how far they had got themselves from God. And they very willingly and warningly put on the, the garments of a griever. And, and you don't find that much anymore, do you? Uh, 
you go to the Lord's house and you barely hear sin much mentioned, much less grieved about, much less uh, troubled about and bothered about and, and, and addressed in the Lord, around in the Lord's people. So they came with a preparation and they came in a sackcloth and then they said on top of that they put earth on themselves. Now, uh, two things with the earth. One thing uh, is dirty, and, and again, that's just a, an external representation about what we're really about, what makes us tick on the inside. It's also a, a representation of what we're made out of. Literally, he made us out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed and uh, uh, he breathed air into us, and, and Adam be and he became the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And, and you know what? All the centuries have gone by, 6,000 years, and we're still made up of the same stuff. And so they were doing this. They were wearing the black. They were wearing the dirt and saying, here we are. We need your help. You know, what a wonderful thing it would be today if not if just this church, but if a group of churches got together and said, you know, here we are, we need your help. Uh, you know what lost people need to do this morning? Here we are, we need your help. Uh, and, and, and so we see then that, uh, it, I mean, Nehemiah's people came with a mind to... Uh, <laughs> to seek the face of God. Uh, and the seed of Israel separated themselves and confessed their sins. Now, uh, we see the, the doctrine of separation. If you remember the way that Ezra tells the story that many of them had to give up their wives and their children because they were not pure Jews. They were of the people of the land and they could not stay connected to them and serve God too. Time and time and time again in the scriptures we learn the teaching that you can't hang on to the world with one hand and the Lord Jesus Christ in the other. You will either love the one or you will hate the other. And so uh, we find that that's a very old teaching and it was a very painful thing. I don't care what kind of child it is. You love them. Remember when Absalom died? David said, Absalom, my son, my son. Absalom, oh, my son. And he was a rebel from the inside out and he still grieved his son. But could you imagine desiring spiritual nearness unto God so much that you turn your children away? You know what Abraham did? He said goodbye to his first son. And uh, that's a <laughs> that that that's more spirituality than I can take. And so we find that that's what they had done here when it said they separated. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquity and the iniquities of their father. So they confessed their sins and they uh, confessed the iniquities of their fathers. Their fathers had left the way, but they didn't say, hey, it was daddy's fault. I didn't know no better. No, no, they confessed their sin and said, yeah, dad didn't teach me right, but I am responsible. You know, we were talking about that kind of laughing uh, at, the, at the middle of the service, but we've raised up a generation that has no personal responsibility at all. Yeah. Yep. You know what? It is not my place to, to raise someone else's children. It's not my place to be sure that people in their 20s and 30s have something to eat. That's not my place. You see what I'm saying? And so they took ownership of their sin, though they had never been taught Though they did not even really know what the Word of God said because of their parents, the parents had passed it along, but they took ownership of it themselves. You know, you know whose sin you have to deal with your own. I don't have to worry about anybody else's. I just have to deal with my own. But you know what? I can't pass the buck. You know, that's Catholicism in a nutshell, is passing the buck of your sin on to the priest. That will never work. Your ownership of it has to be dealt with. And so 
they certainly did that, and, and they could even went on to uh, to say, "Yeah, our fathers did the same thing." Then uh, they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law their uh, their God one fourth a part of the day. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know the Jewish clock and calendar. That's about three hours. That's a long, long time. Now, I know y'all get aggravated at me at times, and I'm probably one of the longer preachers around, or that's what I've been told. I remember, I'll never forget this. I think it was maybe at Olmstead. And I was set with Kenny, and uh, uh, I sat down and I forgot, and he punched me. And uh, he preached an hour and five minutes. I said, oh, they used to. And, uh, 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 but can you imagine just, and, and he didn't say that it was preaching, they just reading the word of God. Right. And what did they have at this time? They had the law, mm -hmm. the Pentateuch, that's it. And could you imagine me simply getting up there and reading that for three hours? That's all they did. You know what? You begin to say, well, that's kind of boring. No, no, that's what we need. That's what we need. And, and, and so we find that's exactly what uh, these gentlemen did. They just got up and, and read the Word, and the Lord God, through the person of the Holy Ghost, applied it to their heart. It troubled them. It troubled, about the, it troubled them about their situation. It troubled them about the sin in their lives and what, and, and what had to be dealt with. And they were troubled about it because of the goodness of the Lord. And notice the other fourth part of the day. So that went from six in the morning to nine, reading the word of God. And from nine to twelve, uh, confessing their sin. Saying, hey, listen, this is what I've been up to. This is the trouble that I've been having in my own life. Uh, and they confessed it. You remember, You know what? Acknowledging sin and your need for help is still a biblical principle even today, but you never ever hear of it. It's a it's a, a forgotten truth, and I don't know if it's a forgotten truth more so than people don't want to deal with it. Uh, it, it, it is. Uh, uh, th there's something that has happened there along the way. But we see that here in this day of Nehemiah that, <coughs> that they got help from doing so. And then notice what it says. They read the book. They confessed their sin. That collectively took six hours and worshiped the Lord their God. So these two other things preempted worship. You know, we live in a day where all it is is praise and worship, praise and worship. And that's fine uh, if it's in its place and they really know what praise and worship is about. But on the very same token, listen, there's other sections of the ministry where we need to just hear the Word of God. That we simply need the Word of God preached to us and we need God's men, God's women, brothers and sisters in Christ acknowledging their needful condition before God and then huh, just worshiping. Just sitting. See, the, the obstacles have to be removed in our spiritual lives before we can genuinely worship. And that's exactly what they did here. And, and they rejoiced in it and they were glad in it. And, and they uh, praised the Lord. Verse 4, then stood up upon the stairs. Now, if you know what they built when they came back, it was a pulpit similar to this, but it was even higher. And I'm glad we don't have that. And the way that I understand it, these boys stood like right here, and then right here, and then right here, and then right here, kind of like in a in, in an angle, and at the very top, the man that was reading the Word of God stood at the at the very top of this. And we have these five sets of men on our. Uh, I think there's six, uh, two sets of six on each side, holding up the man of God. What a wonderful thing that is. Listen, we barely scraped six together today, much less twelve. 
And that, I believe, a representation of one from each tribe. That's my own opinion on that. And, and, and hold up the man of God in prayer. And listen, he wasn't ripping snort. He wasn't doing cartwheels. He was simply reading the Word of God. You know what? That takes support. We live in a desperately wicked day. And simply standing for what the Bible teaches is getting harder and harder. Look around this morning. Now, I rejoice. I'm not discouraged that we have two preacher boys in other places today. That's a good thing. But it's going to be less. It's, when you go down the road and be entertained, if you're lost and you don't know the truth, why would you come here? It's boring, ain't it? Man, they don't even have a laser light show. Right? So why would you go there? See, it, it, it's a difficult day, and what we need to do is, is, is simply pray for the man of God, and not just hear a New Testament when you go to a fellowship or you go to a revival meeting. Get behind the man that's preaching and pray for him. Uh, lift him up to God. The Lord might, uh, by his goodness and grace, save someone. And so we see that they continue that. Verse 6, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. <coughs> What a rich, uh, precious truth when all havoc is breaking loose here and there and here and there. I know the uh, uh, other day I was at, uh, at my doctor's appointment over at Paducah, and I didn't think about it. Then when she said it, I kind of kind of, kind of creeped me out a little bit. This building I go to is over, and it's not in the best part of Paducah. And uh, so I always lock my car and look around real quick before I go to the building. And uh, the building, is, it, it is very dated. And when I get in there... The elevator, it don't have like numbers that pop up, you know, like electronic numbers. It has little tiles, like those 70s clocks we used to have, and they they turn, and uh, and it don't always take you to the floor you push either. And so, uh, me and this woman was sitting there waiting for the elevator together, and she goes, you know what? It makes me nervous after that building had collapsed down in Florida to be in old buildings like this. Well, either I'm too stupid or I just trust God. And I didn't even think about it. And then after she said it, I got to looking around. And, you know, this thing is kind of old. And, uh, but uh, they, uh, we serve a magnificent God. Do we not? You don't think he'd take me in that building and back out? And if it, if it falls and crushes me, is that not by his divine appointment? And you know what? If it get falls and I'm in there, and a day later they finally dig me out, what testimony to give of the goodness of God? They recognized how great their God is, and so we, uh, uh, we, uh, we as the Lord's people, we certainly ought to be able to praise Him in just the way that these folks did. And just because He's God, Thou even Thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven. And the heavens of heaven. So he goes on to describe not only did he, he make the earth and the beauty around it, but he made the stars and the planets and the sea. And up there is a place above the, the, uh, the second heaven is the third heaven, I think is what John calls it. And that's the very abode of God. He's made it all for our enjoyment. And, and when these people confessed their sins and they got right with God and they aligned themselves into the word of God, they begin to realize how magnificent their God is. You know what the danger of preaching today, a baptismal regeneration, if you just be baptized, things is going to be great. If you just say, say this sin, uh, say this little sinner's prayer, things are going to be wonderful. What it does, it brings God down to our level. And we never ever see His magnificence. Right. And when you don't see the magnificence of God, yeah. you'll serve Him like He's a man. And, and, and so we find then that that was just a situation. And these people, as they began to see God for who God is, they, they recognized all that he had done. Verse 7, Thou art the Lord, the God, who didst choose Abram. Now, he begins, I want you to see, it's always a very natural thing in choosing in whom he will. Abram was no uh, nothing to write home about. 
He was not extraordinary in character. He was not a wonderful person to be around. He was heathen and ungodly, just like the rest of his pack. But God chose him. That's the only difference. That is the only difference. God's moving, and just like in the day of Noah, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then Noah spoke individually and specifically uh, to Noah. That's the very same thing here. It was just because of the goodness of God. <laughs> thou, thou art the Lord, the God that who didst choose Abram and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave of him the name of Abraham. Now, if you follow the track of, the, uh, of Abraham's life, that didn't happen right away. That did not happen as soon as he left the earth of the Chaldees. And I don't, I don't think this is what the scripture is even suggesting. It's just making the reference back to that. But you know what? We need to try our faith. If I have studied the life of Abraham like I think and what I believe, that didn't happen for 24 years. In fact, it only happened a year before Isaac was born. When he said, Thou will be no more be called Abram, but thou will be called Abraham. You know what? Sometimes we serve the Lord many, many, many years before we really see what he's doing in our lives. Amen. And that's exactly what Abram was doing. And it took a it took a long, long time. And you know, in the fullness of it, he never he he never saw the fulfillment of God's promise. Probably like he wanted to. He, he knew it was coming. And then Moses came along and certainly he knew it was coming, but he just got a glimpse over into where the land of Israel would be and he didn't get to go. See, I think what we need to learn from examples like this is just be patient. You know how much of the goodness of God you'll see? Just as much as he wants to reveal. And that's it. Remember Abraham, uh, I mean, uh, Moses' request? And uh, he said, I want to see you. And uh, he said, no man will see me and live. And you know what? Moses was okay with that. I don't think it changed his wonder a bit. He said, well, he knew that Moses had a job. And I said, well, he said, well, let's see the backside. I'll, I'll let's see the hunger. And that's it. And, and, and so we find in the very same way that uh, that he, he manifests himself to whom he will. And so he says in verse 8, And found us his heart, meaning Abram, Abraham, uh, thou, and found us his heart faithful before thee. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, uh, the, the changing of his name again was later. But why, what was God uh, evaluating? I believe he was uh, evaluating the faithfulness of Abraham. He said that in all those years, he found him faithful. He never quit believing. <laughs> he, he had to be parted back a little bit. It was not God's plan that Lot ever come with him anyway. And so a lot had to be taken out of the way. And remember, even in that, when Lot was captured, he went down there and he freed that bunch of people and he met Micaiah's deck along the way. Uh, but he was faithful to God's plan. He said, if you go that way, I'll go this way. And if you want to go that way, I'll go this way. You know what? That's a pretty cooperative man, isn't it? Right. I wish I was more like that. You know what we want in a fleshly sense? We want the headland with the best grass. And that's exactly what Lot wanted to do. And, and so we find then that after years of giving these strange commands and, and Abraham following them to the T, he says, I found him faithful. And found us his heart faithful before thee and made us a covenant with him to give him to the land, to give... At, with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Gergeshites, to give it, I say, to his seed 
and has performed thy words, for thou art righteous. And so he's reminding them uh, this belongs to us. But I want you to see that little phrase concerning Abraham. And he found him faithful. Now, uh, if you look back at the majority of your life, can you say that you've been found faithful? Could we say that you're still trying? Uh, you know, that's the thing about Abraham. Abraham fell flat on his face more than once. Tried to sell Sarah off as, as his sister. Uh, got in a mess more than once. But you know what the difference in this is a faithful man. This is a faithful woman. When you when you face plant, get up, wipe yourself off and go again. That's being faithful. What's being unfaithful is not making the mistakes because we're living in the flesh and we're going to make mistakes is giving in to them. Falling and face planting and never getting back up or falling and let the world uh, laugh at you and be swept away by what they're saying to you. That is huh, that is failing immensely and, and, and never, ever impro improving. Go with me uh, very quickly to Genesis chapter 11. And I just want to touch on a little bit on the calling of uh, Abraham, Genesis chapter 11 in uh, uh, verse 3, Genesis chapter 11 and uh, verse 3, I'm sorry, that's not the verse I wanted. Uh, go with me uh, to uh, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 in the very first verse the Bible says now the Lord said unto Abram get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will shew thee now here is God's plan for this man's life and if you if you work the age that he was when uh Isaac was born back in reverse. At this time, he was 65 years old. That's retirement age here in the good old USA. Well, it used to be. Now it's 67. And, uh, and the only reason I know that that stint off made me chomp at the bit, and I'm ready for retirement. Uh, but I want you to see that he was an old man. By any set of standard, he was an old man. And at that age, he called him out. Now, that teaches me uh, two things. First of all, it's never too late. And you're never too old. You know what? It, it, it would be a very sobering thought, even at my age, at 52, packing up everything at the bidding of God and leaving Stewart County forever. But see what we do at the bidding of God. And listen, He can change your wanter. He can make you do things that you wouldn't think you ordinarily would do. That's the business He is in. Now notice what the response is. Uh, the promise, verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and, I, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. It was God's plan for His life. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse of thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Those promises are still coming to pass today when Adolf Hitler uh, cursed the nation, uh, the Jews. You see what happened to the nation of Germany. See, he's still protecting them and uh, those, in, uh, those camps where they took the Jews to die, uh, they were a mockery. And uh, God showed what he would do to them. See, uh, our God is a fulfiller of His promises, and He always has been, and He always will be, and that is uh, that's what He's still doing today. Verse four. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Now we find the the first thing that probably made God say of Abraham is uh, saying that he was faithful. Is how He's described. He was obedient. Now you cannot say you are faithful and be disobedient to the commands of God. Both to the things that are in this book 
And both to the uh, the personal commands he gives you in prayer time. That he gives you to say, you need to do this. You need to go to speak to that neighbor. You need to go to invite that person. You need to see if they will come down to the house of God. Whatever it may be. It may be as simple as bake, baking a skill of cornbread and taking it to a neighbor. But if that's what he says, do it. Even when it seems foolish. Because you remember a 65 year old man with a... Well, I guess it was 75, and it's 65 year old wife taking off to fulfill the promises of God. That seems absurd in man's eyes, but it's what God had appointed them to do. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. A level of obedience and a measure of disobedience. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance and they, that, that they had gathered, the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Shittim, unto the plain of Moreh, and the uh, Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto, him, to thy seed, unto thy seed will I give this land. And he built it an altar unto the Lord who had appeared unto him. Now, I want you to notice two things and we're going one more place. First of all, it was a slow process. They didn't get the full plan right away. They went a little way, and then God met with them again and said, I'm going to renew this promise. Out of thee will come a great nation. He didn't say how. He didn't say when. He didn't show them what they needed to do. He just renewed their promise. And it, because that was so joyful to them, at the renewing of the promise alone, he built an altar and worshiped God. You know what? It may not be Cartwheel Sunday every Sunday. But he'll renew his promise occasionally, will he not? Say, so it, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. And, and so we find that that was sufficient and it caused him to continue on. Anytime we hear, of God, hear from God, it is a time of worship. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 7 in the New Testament. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, the writer addressing the Jewish people uh, probably directly to the church at Jerusalem. Uh, the Jews that had became, that were saved and had became Christian uh, were very, had a very, their own set of problems, so to speak, because it was very difficult for to give up their own ways, just like the heathen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, the very first verse for this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, God who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. Now here we have another just insight into the ministry of Abraham, and what happened all through his life was this, uh, this encounter with Melchizedek, which is at least a type of Christ, if not Christ himself. And, and you know what? Uh, that, that was an amazing thing. Uh, he had, uh, he'd had this battle. He, uh, and at this time he's 85 and he'd had this battle and he came out on top against all these countries. He had freed Lot and some other people. And now he meets the Lord Jesus Christ in the way. And it says that he tied on all that stuff that he had won back from the enemy. And he, uh, he, he, he worshiped the Lord. You know what? Uh, we, uh, we never need say it's too late. Verse 2, to him also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by the interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem or Jerusalem, that is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made and but made like unto the Son of God abideth a priest continually. You know what I think uh, uh, concerning this Melchizedek? I think even today he's who he says he was. 
Because it said that he never, ever changed. That's like a characteristic of the Almighty, is it not? Uh, again, I just think it was a person, a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, without uh, verse 4. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave, ten gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take the tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Uh, but, he, but he whose descent is not counted from them received the tithes of Abraham and blessed them that had promises. And without all, contra and, and without all contradiction and less is blessed of the better. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, uh, excuse me, and of whom he is witnessed and whom he liveth. As many as I say, Levi also receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was in his loins of the father when Melchizedek met him. So we find uh, this faithful Abraham throughout his life and his story even being told to the New Testament church at Jerusalem. Uh, don't worry about faith, faithfulness here. In other words, uh, you're faithful. You come to church routinely. You come to church on time. You're here to be a blessing to other people. And nobody ever squeeze you, uh, hugs you, gives you a pat on the back. That's okay. That's not what you're doing it for. And if that is what you're doing it for, the problem's with you. He's saying that is the time. That is the time to come. So how faithful are you? And if you are faithful, what is... What is the reasoning behind it? I would to God that my faithfulness, if there be any, is for my love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would be that my faithfulness in tithing or ministry or with my children or whatever it may be would not be about me and for pats on the back, but be, would be my commitment to that book. But not because, not because you know, that's what I've been taught, but it's what the Bible teaches. And it's what the Lord God has made real into my heart. What's your, what's your level of faithfulness? See, the reason that's important, and we're going to close, is when things get rough, it will either increase your faith or it will break it. Now, 